Okay. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, so um, I think there are maybe uh, some uh, remote participants as well. So uh, this is uh, uh, good afternoon and uh, probably good evening and uh, good morning if you have anyone from uh, North America and the same time <laughs> time zone. But uh, with great honor, we have uh, Rob from TSB with us for this uh, uh, I think we have um, uh, one hour or one hour and a half uh, for this uh, training uh, in uh, arts of leadership. And uh, Rob is very experienced in dealing with uh, um, all sorts of um, uh, problems we may encounter day to day in uh, ITU uh, T uh, working method in our uh, routine work. and. Uh, Especially, he will uh, try to give very illustrated uh, cases uh, based on his solid experience in uh, reaching consensus. That's the core part of the course. So every time when I take this training, I have a fresh feeling. So uh, I wish all of you will be uh, enjoying, uh, enjoying um, the training material uh, from Rob. And this is a uh, very well prepared, very well received um, slide. So we can uh, benefit much uh, from. Uh, after that, uh, you are welcome uh, to have a question and answer session, but I, I'm sorry, unfortunately, I cannot give you ample time for that, <laughs> probably uh, 10 to 15 minutes. If after that, is still any time uh, left, um, I would like to uh, give you a brief introduction uh, based on my slide to the start of 16 uh, landscape, but that is optional. So let's focus mainly on Rob's uh, training now. Uh, Rob, so I just make a very brief introduction to your slides. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Noah. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, just to confirm, we have this room or this this session is scheduled until uh, fourteen hundred Geneva time. So we have one hour and fifteen minutes uh, remaining. So during that time, <clears throat> I'll try and go through all of the training material, and I'll try to leave enough time for the study group two specific material at the end. Um, as Noah said, uh, there is time for a question and answer session at the end. But also, please feel free to raise your hand if you're online or raise your hand in the room. I'm very happy to answer any questions you may have as we go through, or at least I'll try to answer. I'll, I'll do my best. And if I don't know the answer, I know someone who does. Um, as Noah said, uh, I'm Rob Clark. Uh, I'm the Study Group 2 advisor. So I, I have a similar role to um, Simao in Study Group 2. I've been in TSB for 17 years. I've seen quite a few things, and it's my pleasure to present this training material today. The source of this material is multiple uh, briefings that have been given to the study group chairs after WTSA over many years now. So the, the content is quite refined. It's been checked by people of all levels. And I think it's now reached quite a high level of maturity. So I think the content really is something substantial that we can use as the basis for, uh, for our work. Um, there are three sections. I don't plan on covering all three today, <clears throat> but just the first two. Bit of a delay there. Um, the first is general principles. So we'll go over in some detail um, work item develop work item development, uh, approval procedures, consensus building, and roles and responsibilities. And for those who have attended this training before, there is an extra part in roles and responsibilities at the request of TSAG uh, to cover again some of the high level principles and practices of. Um, incorporating definitions in our work. This is very valuable. Uh, it's, a, it's an important aspect of coordination between many groups. The second part is uh, moving from the theory to the practice. So looking at uh, a meeting as a journey. What are the things that we could do as leaders uh, during the preparation phase? What do we do during the meeting itself? And how do we do the reporting and follow up? 
and I'll cover both of these parts um, during today's session. The third part is hints and tips. These are advanced tools, skills, resources um, that I would recommend taking a look at. So the, the slides you're looking at now are in TD115 uh, of the Plen series, um, attachment, two, uh, attachment one. Uh, I'd invite you to download those slides, take a look at the hints and tips um, and, and um, uh, see what there is there for you. And if you do download the slides, note that there are some, uh, some footnotes on all of the slides referring to the source material for anything that you see today. Okay, starting with work item development. Um, this should be self-evident for those of you who have been doing this work for a while, but I think this, this graphic really demonstrates the core value of contributions in the work of ITUT. Uh, so right in the center of our diagram is member contributions, Word files, contributions and other input documents received by the study group. So those are submitted by whatever means necessary, either by email, if it's a TD, or by direct document posting, if it's a contribution. If the proposal is for a new work item, we'd expect either an A1 justification or an A13 justification. Uh, I won't go into too much detail about that, but this is an explanation for why this work is necessary and why it should be done now in this group. So the stronger the case you can put forward, the better. The uh, contribution will be considered by the study group experts and they'll decide whether or not to start the work. And if they do start the work, whether to adapt the, um, the, uh, the scope of the proposed work item or not. At this stage, we assign one of these key terms. Uh, we assign an editor to the work. We'll look at what that person is and isn't as we go through the presentation. Uh, but the important thing to note is if an editor is not appointed, then it's the rapporteur who would take on that role. And the rapporteurs are one of the most busy roles in the study group. So it's typically, it's quite common for editors or more than one editor to be assigned. Yes, please. don't have the access rights to do that, but uh, let me request it to my colleague. Okay, thanks for that. So I've sent a request to record this session. So it may take a minute or two, but uh, it should it should start shortly. Yes, please. So very basic uh, question. Like once a member contribution is given and it comes to study group, so assignment of subject matter expert, etc., is done by the study group, or the contributor has to suggest who can be subject matter expert. Okay, so the question is, when a contribution is submitted to the study group, who is it that decides which group of experts uh, work on it? Typically, in the contribution, the submitter will indicate one or more questions where the experts are considered to be found. That would be submitted probably to that question, although it may vary. If the management team thinks that the, the work would be better suited somewhere else, the, uh, the contribution may be submitted to one of the other questions instead. And then the decision ultimately is up to the, um, the study group at its closing plenary to decide whether or not to start that work and in which question the work would, be, uh, would take place. In terms of who can contribute to the work, that's on an elective basis. It's really up to all of the experts to decide for themselves which work they want to contribute to, either in terms of which question they attend or which work items they contribute to. So once the work has been assigned to a particular group, it's then up to every individual to decide whether or not they want to be involved in the development. So a contributor is not obliged to uh, suggest subject matter expert or uh, other, other experts for that? Um, the, the submitter can suggest. Um, uh, uh, so they uh, can just suggest, but they can also like leave that post in blank and let study group decides. Is that the case? Yeah. Yes, it's, it's an open question who contributes the work. Um, there, are, there is a concept of supporting members 
So if, if the contributor believes that there's specific entities that would like to uh, contribute to that work, they would typically approach the contact points for those entities and seek their support. And then it's only when any member uh, agrees that they would have their name add or their organization's name added, that information would be included in the A1 or A13 justification. But the request to ask people to join in the work is, uh, is at, the, um, it's at the wishes of the contributor or other experts taking part. Thank you. Okay. So once the editor has been assigned, the key role for editors is coordination. So there's an internal component to that, which means maintaining the latest draft of the uh, work item. Uh, so that's maintained by the editor and it's updated based on discussion and agreement by the experts. And it becomes the baseline for inputs uh, to improve the text from uh, member contributions. Looking externally, there's a coordination activity uh, that's typically done by liaison, although it can be done informally, as can all of this work. There's an informal component and a formal component. So typically, if the work item is of relevance to other groups, that would be liaise to the relevant groups, either seeking feedback or just informing them of what work is being done. And the goal there is to, um, is to handle gaps and overlaps to make sure we don't duplicate work, but we also don't forget anything. So this goes round through multiple iterations. When the work item is ready, it'll be submitted either to the study group or to a working party meeting for consideration to start the approval process. Uh, we'll look at the approval processes shortly, uh, but let's assume that the, um, the study group initiates approval and uh, the work item is, is subsequently approved. Even then, that's not the end of the story. There's a final quality check done by the editing team and TSB and uh, any uh, confirma confirmations are so sought of the editor and other experts if there are any editorial issues raised. And then the document is published and is freely available at no cost uh, worldwide. This then becomes the baseline for future iterations. So that can be in the form of revised versions, amendments, corrigenda, and eventually deletion when the, tech when the technology is replaced by something else. And so it goes round. And the key point in this slide is the, um, the importance of member contributions. You'll see it drives every, uh, every stage of the way. So looking now from a management perspective, um, and particularly um, in terms of uh, technical leadership, there are many resources available online, almost too many to count, but uh, I'll point you towards these in particular. So the first is the um, manual for rapporteurs and editors. It defines their role and the rules that apply to the drafting of text. Specifically for recommendations, there's an author's guide that tells you all about the core material, uh, the difference between normative text and non-normative text, that is what's a standard and what is for information. It gives guidance on how to do referencing, formatting, um, numbering and spelling throughout the documents and so on. <clears throat> In the case where it's a revised recommendation, which happens, for example, with the H series quite frequently, um, we would invite you to use the published text from the web as the baseline for uh, each iteration. That way, all of the editorial improvements that have been done will be captured. In the case of new work items, we would ask you to submit an A1 or A13, as mentioned. And also there is the opportunity for quality review. So we have language experts and technical experts within the study group uh, and within TSB who are ready and willing to contribute. And really, I would recommend reach out to these people at the earliest stage. So even when you're first drafting the first, uh, uh, the first iteration of a recommendation, feel free to reach out to TSB and they can guide you on um, how best to draft this particular text. Again, looking from a leadership perspective, how is coordination done within a study group, first of all? Uh, it's led by the study group and working party chairs. Uh, so this is very much from the, the top down, from a strategic perspective. And this is really done to highlight uh, problem areas, questions, contentious areas early, so the management team is aware and it can handle and prioritize the, the issues accordingly. At the technical level, um, the coordination is done by rapporteurs. As I said, these are very busy people. Uh, they're typically supported by uh, associate rapporteurs or by the editors and, and also by experts. So there's a lot to, to do. So this involves reporting upwards. If there are known hot issues, we would expect the rapporteurs to report that upwards, at least to the working party chairs and possibly to the management team. Um, across between the questions, so there are often overlaps and linkages between the, the questions, and the rapporteurs are typically aware of um, uh, of where those hotspots are. 
and then also working directly with technical experts. So there's a lot of coordination to do, and the rapporteur is really at the center of all of that. We look now at coordination among the study groups. Uh, there are 11 study groups plus TSAG, so again, another opportunity for coordination. This is done officially through liaison statements and also slightly less formally through liaison rapporteurs. So these are people who are actively interested in the work of both groups, who participate in the meetings of both groups and report back and forth and make sure that the latest state of play is reflected um, everywhere that they go. And the third option uh, and the formal options is joint coordination activities. Um, so this is when there's subjects of interest to multiple study groups. Um, and the JCA will normally be established either by the lead study group for that topic or by TSAG as necessary. And the idea here really is to manage gaps and overlaps as so much of the coordination work is. Um, it in, uh, includes coordination of deliverables, so work items under study, and it encourages very broad participation. So this is outside just the study group, it's multiple study groups and potentially other experts as well. And then finally, coordination with external groups. So you'll see some overlap, uh, liaison statements, and also the participation um, at ITUT and external meetings. So this would be rapporteurs and, and liaison rapporteurs, but it can be any study group expert. Um, we are able to reach out and invite non-members of ITU or ITUT to participate uh, per resolution one. Uh, this is in the, uh, by agreement with the chairman, of course. Uh, we have cooperation exchange of information. This is formalized in recommendations A4 and A6. So this is where forums and other bodies are recognized as having a certain special status um, from ITUT's perspective. And this is a very long list. The important thing is that coordination with other groups is built in very deeply into our resolutions and our working methods. Um, so you'll see this, uh, these, are these concepts littered everywhere uh, across our guiding texts. Okay, so decision making and approval procedures. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, ITUT is contribution driven, it is also consensus driven. So we aim for consensus wherever possible to ensure win-win decisions. The alternative would be some people winning, some losing, and that's, that's not the goal of ITUT in, or ITU in its, uh, in its work. So as well as guaranteeing win-win decisions or encouraging win-win decisions, it also avoids voting. Um, this has winners and losers, and it's also limited only to member states, and both of those concepts go against the, uh, the, the fundamental principles that we're, we're working with. Um, a lot of our decisions are soft decisions, so they're not binding in that moment. So even consent and determination, this is the point where the experts believe that approval is, the, the text is ready for approval. Even at this point, when this decision is made, it's still not binding. There's still an opportunity for people to come back and raise concerns at some later stage. So these are soft decisions. Despite that, they're not completely soft. Um, some of them are quite quantifiable. We'll see more, some of those later in the presentation. And then we'll look just briefly at the four main approval processes. So the first is the traditional approval process. It was the only approval process until about 20 years ago. And it's still used today for issues with policy or regulatory implications. So that is not typically study group 16. I think it's very rare for study group 16 to follow TAP, but I did notice you currently have two recommendations that are in the determined state, meaning that um, they were determined in October last year and they'll be considered for approval at this meeting. So it's quite important to know what is the decision-making process around that, which we'll cover in a second. Um, most of study group 16's work is technical, and so they use the alternative approval process. That is an official decision made at a working group or study group meeting, and then the final decision is made on the basis of an online consultation. In cases, sensitive cases, difficult uh, standardization issues, uh, we can always go to WTSA, typically held every four years uh, at the moment. Um, the timing is a little bit off, but typically every four years. And then finally, there's agreement, and that's the approval method we use for non-normative texts, so implementers' guides, supplements, and so on. In all cases, the general rules of ITU apply. Uh, that's a very high-level set of rules. But what I would say for people new to ITU is that these rules are built into our working methods. And typically, if you attend a few meetings, you'll see how meetings are conducted, the role of the chair, what's expected in terms of conduct from the uh, participants. So it's, it's really baked into our work. Um, not all decisions are made by consensus. Some are uh, harder, firmer decisions. So in some cases, we need a 70% majority. 
sometimes a simple majority for voting. Um, it takes only one member state to oppose in order to stop TAP. So that's a very low bar. So TAP approval really means that um, uh, there's a very high level of consensus uh, to go ahead. Uh, similarly, two member states are needed to oppose uh, AAP, but only one is needed to change from AAP to TAP, which is a pretty practical uh, rule. And you see all of our rules are geared towards funneling towards decision making. So it's, it's always, the, the rules are there to help us come to conclusions and not to block the work at all. And sometimes we need unopposed agreement. So when that's the case, the leadership team should know the specific rules in place for this particular decision. And if anyone doesn't know the rules, then that's the role of the Secretariat is to, guide, to offer procedural guidance on these topics. This to me is quite an interesting slide. This shows the, uh, the rate of approvals by the different methods over the last 20 or so years. Um, you can see there's um, peaks every so often that more or less correspond to each of the study periods. Uh, this shouldn't be because um, there's no reason to complete work within a study period. The, the, the technical work can continue from one study period to the next, but there is a tendency, a natural human tendency, to try to con conclude the work before the assembly each time. So you see a growing tendency over the, uh, the last four study periods. And then it was obviously a little bit more confused um, in the last study period because it was extended several times due to uh, uh, our response to COVID. What I draw your attention to here is uh, um, the dominance of AAP in terms of approval making for our, our text, followed by agreement. Um, relatively few TAP texts, regulatory texts, and uh, very, very few, diminishingly few, um, being sent to the assembly, typically because consensus couldn't be reached at the study group level um, or because of the timing. Uh, so if the assembly happened to be coming very close after a study group meeting, um, it can occasionally give us a quicker way to approval. Um, and also, if recommendations have a much wider uh, implication across all study groups, it would be sent to the assembly as well. Um, traditional approval process. I'll I'll just go into a little bit of detail on this one because this is it may be new to some of you in study group sixteen. Um, the concepts are very simple. Resolution one, section nine goes into a great deal of detail. Don't be too put off by that. The, the fundamental principles are quite simple. Uh, the first is that last October, the experts considered the two texts to be mature. The study group agreed and they uh, declared de a determination uh, at the closing plenary. There was then a consultation period, so until uh, about two weeks before uh, this study group meeting, consultation was open to member states only to say whether or not they assign authority to the study group to make a decision. So this is not support of approval its support to consider approval and uh, member states are not blocking approval at that point. Um, once that's done, and this is the stage we're at now, um, the decision to approve or not to approve or something else uh, can be made at this study group meeting. And typically by tradition, the decision is made at the closing plenary, but in fact, it can be any plenary session. So the opening plenary, closing plenary or an interim plenary, if, if that's cool. Normally, we would expect approval because normally, uh, if the experts believe the text is mature, it's past the point of major objections. But there are still options. One is that the text could be escalated to WTSA next year. Um, the text could be approved, it could be not approved, and it could be approved with, uh, with changes if they're agreed at the closing plenary. And then the final step is as a formality, because the determination and the consultation was announced by circular. So this is a message to all the members, official message to all members. Um, the final stage is to send a circular explaining what the decision was. So typically it's the decision was to approve. AAP, I'll go through quickly. AAP is actually modeled on TAP, uh, but just recognizing that as technical standards, there is less need for member states to intervene. They still have the option, but the whole process can be accelerated a lot by not having to wait for a second meeting. So steps one and two are identical, except that instead of determination, we call this decision consent. It means the same thing, it's first stage, and uh, it means the study group or working party uh, agrees the text is mature and is now launching the approval process. Then in place of the other steps, we have a simple online review, which is done via the AAP interface, which you can find on the study group homepage. And in the absence of any further comments, the text is approved after four weeks. So that's uh, very quick by international standards terms. That's a very quick approval process. Um, if there are 
comments received. There are further follow-up processes to resolve the issues, including, if necessary, sending the document back to the next study group meeting, escalating to WTSA, or whatever's needed. Now, there's a lot of text approved via AAP. It's approximately one every day, every year. So it's, uh, it's over 300 per year on a consistent basis. So that would be too many documents to uh, send circulars. So instead, every two weeks, we send a, um, uh, an announcement about all of the changes related to AAP texts. Uh, this is something you can sign up for via the dashboard. Uh, agreement is fairly simple. Um, so again, the experts consider the text to be mature and the study group meeting decides that that's the case. So very quick and easy. And this is done for informative or non-normative documents. So this is supplements, implementers guides, handbooks, technical reports, and technical papers. All of these are defined now in A13. And there is, um, uh, in the footnotes to the slides, you can find more information about these and exactly how they're used. So there's a certain amount of overlap about the, uh, the purpose of each of these publication types and appendices. Okay, and then WTSA, despite the fact it has the most authority, it's also the most simple uh, approval process. So this happens when the study group, um, for whatever reason, chooses to send the text to WTSA for approval. It's typically the WTSA chairman himself or herself who leads the discussion and decision making. So that's a very powerful decision making meeting uh, with the member states in the room. And because all of the member states are present, or in theory they're, they're present, um, the member states in the room on that day have the authority to make that decision. So any of the plenary sessions at WTSA can make an approval decision on recommendations. So a very powerful body. And then as a formality, we would then inform the whole of membership what happened at WTSA uh, as one of the first actions in the new study period. Okay, so turning now towards some of the concepts behind leadership and particularly about consensus. So what even is consensus? Uh, there are many different opinions, and, and this is something that varies a lot between standardization bodies. So there are different definitions. Um, in some cases, it means unanimity or unopposed agreement. So 100% of people think it's the right thing to do. Um, in ISO and IEC, it's the absence of sustained opposition. So this is agreeing to something, even if it's reluctant. In ANSI, it's substantial agreement. In ITU, and not just in ITUT, but across all of ITU, it's a judgment call. It's a subjective judgment call by the chairman. And this is one of the reasons that we're so one of the reasons we're so careful about selecting good chairmen, because these are people who need the subjective skills to make these uh, judgment calls. Uh, what we have here is probably the best definition of consensus in ITU that I've seen. Um, it's a process where the chairman of a meeting accommodates the different views which culminates with the chairman concluding that there, are, there is general agreement for adopting a decision. That means without a vote and without formal opposition. So how do we find this mysterious consensus? Um, there are a lot of skills used by chairs, and I think the best way to learn good chairing is to watch good chairmen in action. And we have a lot in ITUT uh, at all levels, at the um, rapporteur level, working party level, and study group level. Some techniques can help. So how questions are phrased can have very different outcomes and they can guide the decision making a certain way. So you could compare, are there any objections to I see no objection? So one of them is really trying to pull out concerns that people might have. And this would be typically done at a very early stage. For example, um, if the group is making a decision about whether to start a new work item, this is really a good moment to bring out any concerns that people have. We don't want those concerns coming out at the approval, at the approval stage. Much better to bring them out early. If the chair wants to move on and confirm with everybody there are no objections, you could say, I see no objection. Equally, you can reverse the questions. Is there support? And I see no support. So this is, this, this is ways that without forcing a judgment on the uh, participants, the chairman can frame the discussion in a certain way and so that we can all be looking at the decision at hand in the same way. Um, we have a lot of precedent in ICUT. So uh, a lot of our chairs are very experienced. They've seen a lot of um, things happen. And so we can use the term normally. This can guide towards a more standard, uh, adopting the same approach that was used in the past. And also as appropriate. So this leaves a little bit of wriggle room that should we need to accommodate a little bit at some later stage, uh, the decision can be softened a little bit. So it's, it's not too rigid. And in any case, um, it can be very helpful, especially in long circular discussions where the same entities are making the same point again and again. It can be very powerful for the chairman to summarize the issues at hand, to explain what is the decision we need to make today. 
and then to help identify where the experts agree and where they disagree. And that can often be a shared understanding that can help people to move forward, even if they don't share exactly the same uh, conclusions. So despite all of that, despite best efforts, we can still reach a deadlock position. And as I've said before, ITU has many ways of driving the work forward, funneling us towards a decision. So a common practice is a coffee break. This is a really good uh, technique to use if the group seems to be very close to a decision and just needs that little push over the edge. So maybe the experts, two or three experts, can gather in the corridors, have a discussion, and come back uh, and be ready to make a decision. Um, if it's the end of the day, uh, the chairman might call everyone to sleep on it. This is a euphemism for stepping outside, maybe having dinner together, maybe reflecting a little bit, maybe checking with the experts back home and see if, they can, if people can come up with a, a way forward and then come back to the discussion the next day. Sometimes it's uh, the right moment for a chairman to intervene, to make a proposal. It could be a compromise based on what the chair is seeing, offering something new, a different perspective. That's a, a real fresh way of looking again at the problem. So this is a, an excellent opportunity for the chair to stay back as long as needed, but also be willing to step forward when the time is right. If there's more discussion needed, and it's clear that some experts really need the opportunity to, to discuss this in detail, and it may not be a topic of interest to all of the experts, an ad hoc session or an ad hoc group could be created to, to send people away, and their task is to find a solution. So it really pushes everyone. They have a shared, a common goal of finding a consensus. So it's quite a powerful tool because it frames the discussion they have in terms of finding agreement, not opposing each other. Uh, consensus by exhaustion. Consensus is consensus. It could be if a discussion goes on for hours or even from one meeting to another. Eventually, the experts have had enough and they say, look, we can live with this. Just because we don't want to keep discussing it, we can live with it. It's not a great form of consensus, but it is, a, uh, it is agreement. Sometimes the solution is very simple. There can be consensus on the majority of a draft new recommendation, and it can be just one or two sentences where there's controversy. And the solution may simply be to remove the controversial text. Sometimes the simplest solutions are the, uh, the best ones. Um, I've mentioned that we don't like to do voting. But the threat of voting, knowing that option is available, um, can help focus attention. And in all cases, um, consensus doesn't need unanimity. So it is possible that if one or two voices are still dissenting at the end of discussions, that dissent can be recorded either in the meeting report or potentially in a footnote in the recommendation. So that doesn't diminish the standing of the recommendation, uh, but it does mean that the, um, the dissenting voices are um, reflected and respected. So what is the role of a leader in, um, at all levels in ITUT? Uh, the first one is to help everybody keep the end in mind. So rather than getting pulled into the discussion of the day, thinking strategically, thinking in the longer term. The leader should be fair and impartial. That should be their nature. But it's also important that they're seen to be fair and impartial. So that means both having integrity and building that reputation over time and doing that by, by consistent uh, behavior with integrity. Um, it's important to listen with care and also to be sensitive to the differences in language and culture. Uh, I'm sure you've seen in the meetings here that there are very different approaches from one entity to another, from one member state to another. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of coordination, it's important the management team has a good concept of what are the hot topics and to be briefed on the issues at hand before the discussion takes place. That way the chairman can, uh, can intervene uh, appropriately uh, and add value to the discussions. Um, we ask an awful lot of the leaders. Uh, we'd also, as well as being technically good and competent, uh, it's also important to be socially available. So uh, that means being seen, being in the cafeteria, being available for conversations, uh, be sociable, be available, be responsive. Um, here's a gentle art. It's very important that every voice is heard. And sometimes the chair may need to encourage or create space for some people to intervene. Uh, uh, the chair may even invite somebody to speak who hasn't asked for the floor. Uh, the important thing is that every, every voice is heard. But equally, to balance that, there's also a time and a place to close the debate. The debate and, and that can be done gracefully. The most common way is to say, um, I want to close the discussion now. Um, uh, I see um, a request for the floor from three candidates, uh, from, from three delegates. Um, um, we'll listen to these three delegates, and then I'm closing the, closing the list. So you let people know this is their last chance to speak, and then you stick to what you've said. Um, 
We'd also invite you to consult with a TSB counsellor and advisor. You're not just tapping into the knowledge of one person by doing that, but you're tapping into the combined knowledge of the whole of TSB because the, uh, the counsellors, advisors are pretty well connected. And if we don't know the answer, we're very willing to admit that and see people who do know. So we have many decades of experience now. We can, we can certainly offer advice at any moment. And the final thing is to, to recognize this whole thing as a process. This is not just one meeting, it's one of many meetings. And the relationships that people form today um, pay dividends over long periods of time. So it's important to thank contributors, even when there's been very difficult discussions. It's important to remember that tomorrow is another day, there'll be other meetings and other opportunities to collaborate. And that extends as far as the, uh, the staff who support the meetings. That includes captioners, interpreters, and so on. So looking now at roles and responsibilities. Um, we have the study group chairman and vice chairman, typically one vice chair per region. Uh, that's the, the goal, at least. We have working party chairs and vice chairs as necessary. Rapporteurs and associate rapporteurs leading the work of the questions. Liaison rapporteurs uh, in a coordination role. Editors. And then whatever this term is, delegates, experts, participants, this is effectively the same thing. This is the group of international experts um, who contribute to the work and they're the lifeblood of the work. Uh, and they, they have a slightly different name depending on whether they're physically present at the meeting or whether they're contributing in some other role. And then we have the secretariat so that's made up of a counselor or advisor. This is the same role effectively, um, but it's, um, uh, they correspond to different grades within the uh, um, UN structure and an assistant. So normally you would have one counselor, one assistant, and you have Simao and uh, Heba for this meeting. The management team is specifically the study group and working party chairs and vice chairs, along with the secretariat. And then the extended management team or leadership team comprises the rapporteurs as well. And so those groups will convene as necessary to have the right level of strategic planning discussions. So there is a shared responsibility uh, in management across all of the expert, but, but experts, but particularly the management team. Um, so it's for the process and the quality of deliverables. Um, these are often called the big five deliverables. So that would be meeting reports, lists of documents for major decisions, approval and so on, uh, work program updates. So that includes proposed new work items and changes in leadership, outgoing liaison statements, and then plans for future activities. So these, um, each of these is normally found in one TD and you can see exactly what is the output of this this whole set of meetings over two weeks, you can go to these documents and see what was the outcome. Um, I'm gonna go through fairly quickly the uh, responsibilities of each of the roles. At the level of study group chairs, um, we're looking for proven strategic leadership. So this typically means extensive experience in leadership positions within ITU or ITUT. Um, their role is to facilitate consensus building. So you can see this is very strategic. Um, they make sure that working methods are followed and also the principles such as openness and fairness are respected. When necessary, they intervene. But the majority of the time, they're observing, they're stepping back and uh, facilitating good discussions and good decision making. They also have an external facing role uh, representing the study group at TSAG and, uh, and other meetings. Working party chairs, you'll see there's a lot of common ground. So again, we're looking at this level for um, a demonstrated knowledge, experience, and managerial skills. Uh, and that's gener generally gained through uh, being a rapporteur of one or more of the questions, typically within the same working party. We're looking for continuity of participation in the past and the promise to participate in the future, uh, so future avail avail availability. And the expectations of the working party chair is quite clear. They are to report to study group plenaries, start, uh, opening and closing plenaries. Uh, they chair the working party plenaries and they oversee and manage the work uh, between meetings and during meetings. So it's a very heavy set of responsibilities. Rapporteurs, this is really where the technical work is being done. And so the work of the rapporteurs and the editors cannot be uh, overstated. As with anybody else, they, they should possess knowledge, experience and management skills. So very similar to the chairman roles. Uh, but a lot is expected of them. So they're expected to participate in study group, working party and question level meetings. They also need to know the rules and assert them at all of these sessions, uh, including the drafting rules. Uh, they should lead coordination with the other groups and be aware of what's going on in their domain, not just in ITU, but outside as well. Uh, but they're not alone. They can seek assistance from many other people, associate rapporteurs, their editors and other experts. 
uh, the TSB editing team and the secretariat, the study group secretariat. Specifically for the meetings of rapporteurs, um, we have physical meetings, although this is less and less common. The majority of these meetings are held as e-meetings. Um, for physical meetings, people need to plan their travel, plan time off, things like that. So we, uh, uh, we normally organize these at least two months ahead of time. Uh, for e-meetings, we still need a bit of advance warning, but uh, typically two weeks is a minimum. The rapporteur also manages the meeting documents. So um, uh, for study group meetings, it's the secretariat that are responsible for documents. For rapporteur group meetings, it's the rapporteur who's responsible. And again, rapporteurs are expected to uh, assert the rules, including the participation by invited experts. So if an invited expert is required, whoever is suggesting that, maybe this comes back to your question from earlier, if somebody thinks that someone outside ITU should be involved in the work, it would be for the study group chairman to invite them according to the rules in Res 1. And also as well as input documents, they also manage the outputs. So this would typically be a meeting report, uh, latest drafts of recommendations, liaison statements, and so on. Liaison rapporteurs, this is quite a fluid role. Um, they would need to represent either a member state or a sector member. The reason for that is they need decision-making power and they need the right to participate in multiple groups. Obviously, associates can only take part in one group, and so uh, they're not suitable for a uh, liaison role. Um, their work is to support the rapporteur or rapporteurs. They're expected to attend the meetings of different groups, uh, participate in correspondence activities, that's the use of the mailing lists, and then submit an activity report to study group plenaries. And we all know that doesn't always happen, but it is good practice. And it means even if there's nothing to report, it's more useful to report nothing has happened in the last six months. That's a more useful report than not submitting a report. So it's strongly recommended. Editors, this is probably one of the areas that's most misunderstood. Um, editors are often misunderstood to be the authors of recommendations as if they personally own the content, and that's not the case. Their role is very specifically to support the rapporteur in preparing draft texts. They're not the author, but they are the coordinator. They're responsible for incorporating changes um, according to documented agreement. So by documented agreement, we mean typically input contributions. So there's, there's a documented input or the output documents in the, in the form of meeting reports or latest draft texts based on the discussions that happens during the meeting. So they, they're reporting what happened, they're coordinating what happens, uh, ensuring quality. They're not in their own rights uh, drafting the recommendations. So it's important to distinguish between those two roles. Um, they can be given quite wide editorial powers. Um, so they can be asked to go away and reorganize the text to change clause numbering, terminology, and so on. But they would typically be given clear editor, um, editing instructions to go and do that. So none of this means that editors can't contribute their ideas, but it just means they have to be careful about when they're in the role of editor and when they're in the role of contributor. And typically they would announce that from the floor. Uh, they would say, I'm now acting on behalf of my organization. And as with anybody else, uh, we'd invite you to turn to TSB and especially to the editing team if you have any questions about uh, any draft recommendation you might be working on uh, as an editor. So this is the new material that was requested by uh, TSAG. I see Olivier is on the call. Uh, and, and please, Olivier, jump in. If, if I'm missing anything, misrepresenting anything, please uh, let me know. Um, so there was a call made to improve the quality of definitions across the whole of ITUT. Uh, so this may, basically means better coordination, so the reuse of defined terms, and um, a more consistent approach to how um, referencing and definitions are done. And I'll try and give you the highlights of that in this, in this session. Um, a lot of this is based on the author's guide for drafting recommendations. And if you were to look in there, um, you would see there's a, a section on including definitions, and then there's guidance on the development of definitions. So you can see in two parts how to do this. Wherever possible, we try not to define new, um, terms multiple times. So the first job to do, if you want to use a special term within a recommendation, we'd recommend that you go and check the database. We'll come back to that later. Check the database to see whether the term has already been defined and whether that definition meets your purposes. So if that is the case, so if we take this example here, decoupling element taken from K44, in this case, the term is already defined. And in this recommendation that we're working on now, we just refer to it, um, given the term, 
um, given the term, and because it's being normatively referenced, we're just saying, if you want to know what decoupling element means, go to K44 and K44 will tell you. So this way, there's no duplication of text. That term is defined in one place only. And this way, if K44 changes the definition of decoupling element, this recommendation by reference changes the definition. So that's the most efficient way of doing it, the preferred way of doing it. It could be you prefer a different way. Uh, in this case, you can see it's the same reference, decoupling element, it still comes from K44. But in this case, we've copied the entire definition into this recommendation we're working on in, uh, in, in this new text. So a couple of things to point out. The first is that this is no longer a normative reference because um, we don't need to open K44 to see what decoupling element means. We're just, we're just saying the definition is taken from K44. So this reference is downgraded from a normative reference uh, to a bibliographic reference, and that's shown by the B dash at the start of the definition. Um, that would apply unless K44 is also normatively referenced for some other reason. So. Uh, we would always use the highest form of reference, either normative or non-normative reference uh, uh, in the whole text. Um, another important note, and this has been noticed by TSAG, is not being done consistently across the study groups, is that copyright clearance must be obtained by the editor from the copyright holder if a definition is to be copied from an external document, that is, any document outside ITU. So it doesn't apply to the R or D sectors or T sector. Um, if assistance is needed, then as always, reach out to the study group secretariat and they can guide you on how to go about getting that copyright clearance. But the important thing is it should be done. Um, so if the term has not been defined elsewhere, uh, the definition will be included in the, in the uh, I think it's section three, uh, clause 3.2, uh, terms defined in this recommendation. So here's an example. So if we're in K44 and we're defining the term decoupling element, you can see there's no reference to any other document. We just say, decoupling element and we give the uh, uh, and we give the description so this definition is made up of three main components the first is the term being defined so decoupling element uh, the next is the class of object so it's a component and the third is the distinguishing characteristics that define that term and you'd be surprised how often this basic model is not followed so please follow this model once you see a few um, definitions defined this way um, this becomes very natural to talk in these terms. And you'll also notice that we don't use circular referencing. So we don't say that a decoupling element is an element that does something. That would be reusing a term in, that's already in the, uh, the term being defined. So we try to use completely new terminology um, in, the, in the definition. Okay, some quick checks when defining a new, a new definition. Um, does it follow the model we just saw on the previous page? Um, is the term given in the singular? Normally we use singular, sometimes it has to be plural, but typically singular. Um, do we use the same part of speech? So if the term is a noun, is the definition given as a noun and so on? Is it standalone? So does that mean um, there are no uh, abbreviations that are not expanded? And can the definition be understood entirely in its own terms? It doesn't refer to figures, it doesn't refer to things outside itself. Is it concise? So typically, um, definitions of one sentence, no more than that. Uh, although amplifying information can be included um, uh, in a note if necessary. Um, is it given in a single sentence? Um, and the definition should not be circular, so it shouldn't, def it shouldn't refer to itself. Um, and the final element which is not done consistently across study groups is harmonization of terminology. So there is a process to this. So step one is to go to the uh, um, terminology database. You can see the hyperlink here. It's also linked uh, from the uh, home pages or the resources page uh, on the study group, uh, home, um, on the ITU web pages. Um, if you go there and no suitable term exists, um, we recommend that um, any draft definition is um, submitted to the working party or to the study group to be shared with the study group experts and to the vocabulary rapporteur for advice. So the, um, every study group should have a vocabulary rapporteur who understands fully the process and knows how to do the coordination. Um, and that should happen even if the definition may be uh, modified at some future meeting. The role of the vocabulary rapporteur is to make sure that coordination is done correctly within the study group and across study groups. And so terms will be submitted to the uh, standardization committee for vocabulary 
and the Coordination Committee for Terminology, the uh, SCV CCT, and copies to other uh, study groups. And likewise, the study group may receive inputs from other groups um, seeking suggestions on their definitions. So quite a lot to take on board. I think the key takeaway is that we should be very careful when, when uh, making definitions, not to duplicate and to do it very carefully. If you, if you want guidance, there is the vocabulary rapporteur and the secretariat available to give you advice. Um, and so going through the last of the um, uh, responsible roles within a study group is the TSP secretariat, just so you know a little bit about how we're made up. We have a director of TSB and a deputy director. We have two main departments, the study groups department and the operations and planning department. Each of those has a head or chief. Within the study groups department, we have the counselors and advisors and a team of assistants. Uh, and these are your entry points, so you should know these people by now. If you don't, it's well worth getting in touch. They're very friendly, lovely people. Um, then the operations and publication departments, and this covers a range of support services. So logistics, registration, electronic working methods, IT development, and the e-meetings team. And then also Annibal and the editing team. What do we do? Uh, pretty much we're here for you. We're, we're here to help. We're here to create a forum for you to have successful discussions. So we facilitate standards development in whatever that means. So we can offer procedural advice. Uh, we hopefully can offer some subject matter advice of the technical topics under discussion. And where we can't, we know who can offer advice. So we're, we're definitely a good entry point for that. Uh, we coordinate routine study group activities during meetings and between meetings. We're here to ensure the quality of the output standards. So sometimes that's proactive. I know Simao is very forceful in encouraging good practice among the experts. Uh, which is hard work, but the outcomes are well worth the effort. So um, sometimes the uh, the quality improvements are done in collaboration. Sometimes we do it, uh, we, we step back and we, we help you in whatever way we can. Administrative, administrative support, so contact us and we'll, we'll help in any way we can. Particularly document processing and distribution, uh, as and when needed, and meeting logistics. So if you need a room, if you need a whiteboard, we're here to help and you can uh, reach out to us and we'll, we'll help you get the job done. Okay, very quickly now, we'll go through um, the timeline of a study group meeting and just give you an idea of how these concepts move into practice and, and maybe give some guidelines on, lines on how to work efficiently and to a high standard. Um, the typical study group meeting plan, and I think study, study group 16 is, is fairly typical. You tend to have a study group opening plenary and closing plenary at the start and the end of the meeting. Um, next to that, you'll have a working party opening and then drop down into the detailed discussion at the question level sessions, ad hoc, special sessions, and so on. And then at the end of the two weeks, you would have a closing plenary at the working party level, and then a closing plenary at the study group level. And this way you have the right breaking down of decision making, and then the, the merging together of decision making. Some study groups have a mid-meeting plenary, so group 13 does that, for example. And the idea of the opening is to set the scene for the coming meeting and uh, address, uh, to raise up any issues that need to be discussed. The majority of the work is spent discussing, drafting and editing. And then the last couple of days are typically about working on the meeting outputs and, uh, and reaching agreement, final agreement at the uh, study group level. This is typically one to two weeks. I think your meeting is, uh, is two weeks this time. So remembering back to the big five outputs, there is always a corresponding input. So in terms of planning for successful outcomes, think about the inputs. So the agenda for the meeting will determine what's discussed and that will lead directly to the report. And often the two documents will follow a very similar structure. There's the report of interim activities. This is coming into the meeting and we discussed and considered, and that will lead to a plan for future interim activities. Coming into the meeting, we have existing work items or proposed new work items. Uh, and that's typically driven by member contributions. And the outcomes will be two different uh, uh, big five outcomes. One would be the work items for major decisions, and the other would be general updates to the work program. And then finally, some of the incoming liaisons will lead to outgoing, outgoing liaisons. So you see that there's definitely a mapping. And so the preparation phase is really key to, to setting up good outcomes. Similarly for time management, start with the end in mind. Um, the first point for many people uh, preparing for a meeting is the collective letter, the announcement for the meeting. Um, 
and the draft time plan is often based on the final time plan from the last meeting. So it's a bit of a copy paste as a starting ba basis for time planning. Um, we'd ask you to invite uh, to anticipate session requirements. If you have any special requirements, for example, captioning, uh, interpretation, remote participation, anything like that. Uh, but also specific joint sessions, ad hoc sessions, um, any working outside normal working hours, uh, remote participation, uh, receptions and so on, anything like that, please, what we said is, please alert us as early as you can. We, we don't like saying no to anything, but sometimes if time is a factor, we have to say no when we could have said yes if we'd been given a little more warning. So please alert us as early as possible. And this is in the frame of before the meeting even starts. Um, the management team will typically meet several times before a study group meeting to coordinate. Um, this is really at a high level to ensure coordination and discussion, to work on the overall time plan, to identify hot topics and have an established approach to, uh, to, to how to handle them, wh which sessions should handle them, would there be ad hoc sessions needed, uh, is any conciliation needed between the parties. Uh, think again about joint sessions, joint activities. Um, Think about cooperation with other bodies internally within ITU or externally, any liaisons received, any liaisons that are important to send. And then a really good practice, and this, this applies at any level, at the rapporteur level, worker party, study group level, is to draft the meeting report in advance. And this is where the structure of the agenda can lead to the structure of the report. So we would suggest preparing a skeleton report early. So the actual content, the outcome of the discussions, we don't know yet, but we do know that something's going to be discussed and therefore there will be a placeholder for, for whatever the outcome is. Now, reports are very difficult to write because they're, they're full of contradictions. So it should be comprehensive and succinct at the same time. So that's a, uh, that's a challenge in its own right. Um, it, in all cases, it should be clear and well organized and typically following the same pattern from one meeting to the next. It makes it a lot easier for delegates to read um, a report if it's in the same structure each time, a consistent structure. It should be written objectively. If there was disagreement in the meeting, then both sides or all sides should be reflected. And also we've we found it's better if the report is results focused. So rather than recounting everything that was discussed and who said what, um, it's far better to focus on what was the outcome of the group, what consensus was reached, and just include other detail as it's necessary to aid understanding. Um, per PP decision 14 on the use of hyperlinks, uh, typically it's better to reference other information than it is to include it. So if key information is contained in a question report, it's way better to include that information by reference rather than copying it and pasting it into the, say, the working party report. Also, this is a huge task, but we're, we're a large group of people. So at all levels of leadership, it's a good idea to delegate tasks. That way people um, can have a voice in the work, they can contribute maximum value, uh, and you can encourage good collaboration and also manage, manage the workflow, especially in the last two or three days where the workflow is overwhelming at times. If that work is shared evenly and done at the right time to a high quality, uh, the work becomes manageable and is not overwhelming. So for meeting reports, some ideas, some do's and do nots. Um, delegate the tasks to ensure mutually quality and timeliness. These are often seen as uh, opposites to each other, but done the right way, they can be friends with each other. Prepare the report, uh, the, the skeleton of the report early, and then add the content in real time during the meeting. So a lot of rapporteurs update their report after every day of meetings, which means the final day is fairly small changes. Uh, that's a very efficient way of working. Um, outline the organization of the work, so structure the report to reflect the, uh, the organizational structure of whatever, your, uh, whatever group you're working for. So mention the decisions made, that includes any groups that might be set up and their terms of reference and their leadership. Um, we, talk, we typically have a section on future meetings or future activities. And you can also refer to participant lists, um, a summary of contributions and so on. So you can refer to some of that information or you can copy paste as it's appropriate. Um, but whatever you do, it's a good idea to do it systematically. And it's an even better idea to do that consistently across the whole study group. So that's definitely something we'd encourage. Um, try not to attach additional documentation that uh, bloat the work. We don't need to copy paste and repeat the same content. It just makes it harder for everybody to, to follow what's happening. 
And also, um, please don't delete ITUT reference numbers. Um, so a typical example here is if a figure is appearing in a new draft recommendation, it's good that everybody knows where, where the original version of that came from. So it's just an editorial point. During the meeting, and we're nearly closed, uh, we're nearly finished now. Um, all of that was done in preparation. All of that was before day one of the meeting. Um, during the meeting, as leaders, you'd be expected to, to be there fully present. So anticipate and respond as needed. Actively monitor and coordinate the progress of the groups. Um, inform upwards. So uh, as chairs, check in with people, see what's going on. Uh, but equally, uh, report upwards if any issues come up. It's far better to avoid surprises. There are very few nice surprises in this work. And again, uh, red star on the logistics. So if you have a need for extra sessions, any changes, cancellations, remote participation, or anything else, please alert TSB as soon as you can. We do like to say yes, and normally we can find a way to accommodate your preferences, but please do it as early as possible. Chairing meetings, in practical terms, um, remember the legal framework. Um, it's useful to know the general rules, the constitution and convention, but it's not strictly necessary to know every word of it. But it is important to understand the principles and to refer to people if, uh, if you need further advice. It is very useful to know resolution one. It's full of common sense and it makes a lot more sense to see it in practice in meetings. So it's good to know the resolution and also see the practical aspects of it. But at the end of the day, um, our working methods uh, reflect all of the rules in force. So if you work along consistent lines, you'll be working within the, uh, the guiding principles. In terms of handling interventions, um, it's the chairman's role to give the floor when uh, somebody has requested it or to invite someone to take the floor. Um, I know I do this, I'm not so good. Um, we should consider non-native speakers, especially uh, non-native English speakers and also treat the captioners and interpreters as a proxy for those na non-native speakers. So I know I speak too fast, I apologize for that, uh, but it's important as much as possible to speak slowly and distinctly. And also in terms of interventions, it's a good idea to start the invention with a standard phrase. So thank you, Chairman, I'm speaking as, and then you would give the affiliation. And also at the end, you'd say, this concludes my intervention. This serves a couple of purposes. One is just to let everyone know who you are and what you're doing. But the second is, especially in plenary sessions that are interpreted, this means that everyone can frantically switch with their buttons so they're listening to the correct language channel. So if someone says, I'm speaking in Arabic, those who don't speak Arabic can quickly switch across to the English channel if they were previously on the floor channel. So it's, it's a good practice. And then finally, uh, reporting and follow up. This is the shortest part. Uh, there is still work needed, even after the final hammer comes down to close the meeting. There is still work going on after the meeting, especially for TSB. Um, the, the meeting re reports need to be finalized. Um, liaison statements will be received and sent between meetings. There's a lot of interim activities and approval processes that go on um, between study group meetings. And also we'll seek your expertise um, during the editorial review of texts. So if a recommendation has um, technical clarifications that are required, um, the editor or the um, counselor will reach out to you and seek your guidance. Um, leaders would need to manage the correspondence activities, so drive the work, especially with uh, WTSA preparation and the new study period. That's an area where um, the experts need guidance and leadership to, to make sure the work is driven forward. In general terms, um, uh, the experts would promote our work outside ITU. And we're always in a stage of preparing for the next step. So there's always a meeting um, uh, just a few months away. So there's always something to do, it never ends. So with that, that, uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. And I know that's a lot of information and uh, I think we went at quite a, a high speed. Uh, we still have 15 minutes, so I'd uh, first of all invite any questions and then I'll, uh, with pleasure, hand over to Noah for, for your part. So are there any comments, any questions on anything that we've covered today? Yes, please. Yes, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, just a simple logistical question. Uh, how do we get the slides? Uh, yeah, so the slides are in TD115 of the plan series. Okay. And there are two attachments. This is attachment one, and then Noah's slide describing the work of study group 16 are in attachment two. Thank you. 
Any other questions or comments? Yes, please. Thank you for the thank you for the presentation. So I want to I wondering how the work program is updated as you illustrated. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, how is the work program updated? This varies a little bit from study group to study group, but I'll tell you what I believe best practice is. So we have a work program database, which is maintained by the TSB Secretariat. This keeps a track of all work items and all of the associated information. So basically, when you fill an A1 or an A13 um, justification form, that information at the right time will be copied into the database and then people can search for it. So that's the, the first idea. Before each meeting, a TD or multiple TDs will be produced by TSB which are an output of the current database. It'll list all of the work items and the key metadata related to those work items. Um, and that would be the baseline for discussion during the meeting. One of the rapporteur's job during the meeting is to keep a track of any changes to anything in the work program for their respective question. And what we'd normally ask is the rapporteur would submit um, an updated version of the work program table with revision marks that would be submitted as a, a new TD or revised TD, which would then be considered by the uh, the closing of the uh, rapporteur meeting, sorry, the question level meeting, and ultimately considered by the study group closing plenary. So in that, uh, in that uh, table of information would be all of the changes to work items, changes to baseline text, addition of new work items, changes of leadership, all of that stuff will be included in revision marks in, uh, in that TD. That way it's obvious to everybody what's changed. And then following the meeting, the secretariat will then take that TD and implement all of those changes shown in revision marks. They'll transfer all of those changes into the living work program. And that way the information could be interrogated directly via the, um, by the experts. And there is constant access on the study group 16 webpage. There is a link called a work program. At any time, you can look at that link and you can search for, um, you can filter and search and you can look for whatever you want to know in that, uh, in the database. And the final way things are changed is if anybody identifies an error that's been made at any level, please contact the secretariat and we'll take the necessary steps. So we'd normally consult with the leadership team to make sure that we should correct the data and then we'd inform everybody of what we've done. So I hope that answered the question. I think there was possibly a follow-up. Okay, thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, very uh, well presentations. I have maybe uh, detailed questions. I, I want to know if there are any uh, guidelines uh, for uh, for for us. For example, for example, we uh, always face uh, some some freeze su such as you use the uh, the may. I use the, it's permitted to. Uh, he is using the uh, can optionally. So is there some uh, some uh, some standards for us to which freeze is 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 allowed it in uh in itu recommendations yes thank you okay thank you yes excellent question phrasing is important there are terms like um, can could shall should these have very specific meanings in terms of the recommendation um, guidelines are contained in the author's guide for drafting recommendations there's actually a section on that and i think there's a section as well in the editor and rapporteur guidelines um, and they, they explain exactly what is meant by those key terms. So it's not TSB or anyone else's position to tell you which phrase you should use, but um, it is important you understand what the difference is between should, for example, and shall. Should means that um, this is a mandatory requirement normally. So there, it's a mandatory requirement, but there may be exceptions. The term shall means that it, it is, it, it's mandatory and there are no exceptions. So in terms of the phrases to be used, it's really, uh, it depends on the guidelines in those documents I mentioned, combined with your technical expertise to work out whether something really is a shall or a should or a can or a could. I hope that that helps. Okay. Uh, actually, I face a problem. The editor and the raptor has different uh, opinions on this. Yes, uh, the raptor thinks uh, it's permitted to, it's not allowed used in the in the draft, but the editor think it, it's permitted to should be used in this draft. So I want to know, is there any uh, official uh, guideline for editor or, or raptor? Never mind, yeah. 
Thank you. Yeah, that's a very difficult situation. And, and for that, I would just refer back to the um, the slide on consensus building, which is it's quite understandable that people have different views. In fact, it's the reason we come here is if we all agreed, we wouldn't need to write these standards down. So the fact that people have different opinions is built into our work and it's perfectly normal. Um, there are many sources of uh, guidance that, that are available, even at this level, if a rapporteur and an editor have different opinions. Um, we have the working party chairs and the study group chairs who could be invited to, to offer their opinion. Um, the discussion could be shared with the group. So perhaps experts from in the group could find a way forward, uh, maybe rephrasing the, the, the sentence or approaching it in some different way. And then from TSB's side, we can also offer advice. So we have the councillor and the TSB editor. We're at least willing to offer possible ways forward. So I think that's probably the answer is to, to seek quite widely what are the alternatives available, uh, options that are going to work for everybody, and then take the option that's going to be um, most appropriate. And sometimes the way to resolve these things is to not try and fix a specific paragraph, don't try and fix a particular sentence, but rather step back and think, how can the different differing opinions be approached differently? What's a different way of reconciling the needs of one party and the other party? But really, what you're talking about is uh, consensus building, which is um, it, it's not something we can mandate. It's just something we could encourage. So I know it's a partial answer. I'm sorry, it's only a partial answer. Yes, please. Yeah, I think it, it relates also to the ITUT editing guideline you showed. Is it uh, something we can download? And uh, do we find the link in the uh, slides or where do we find the link? Yes, exactly. So all of the uh, documents I've mentioned today are available quite easily from the study group uh, home pages. It's either available directly on the study group page or you'll see a tab at the top of the screen called resources. So under resources, there's the um, editing guidelines, there's the templates you would need um, and the uh, author's guide. Sorry, sorry, there's the author's guide and the guidelines for editors and rapporteurs. All of those are under the rapporteur, um, resources tab on the study group home page. And they're all, the um, direct URLs for all of these resources are in the footnotes uh, in the slides. Yes, please. Um, thanks for your presentation. It's very clearly and uh, useful for our uh, new audience. Yeah. So uh, my small question is that uh, the ICT technologies is growing very quickly. And uh, currently, it's, uh, ICT is uh, now integrated with the traditional industry like that, uh, like the automotive and the transportation, others like that. So uh, how or whether we were considering or reconsidering the scope of our SG or some of the questions or some of the working package like that. So how to promote this uh, progress and uh, how to make the dec uh, uh, dec uh, decision, yeah. Great, thank you. So the mandate, the overall mandate for the study group is defined by WTSA normally every four years. The next one will be uh, next uh, Q4 next year. Um, WTSA, WTSA will take as its inputs documents from all of the study groups. So there is a report part one, and part two. I think it's the second part um, will contain the uh, proposed question texts and the proposed mandate for study group 16 as decided by the study group experts. I think I'm saying this back to front. The opportunity for you and other experts to define the mandate and reflect these changes um, is being involved in the WTSA preparation uh, ad hoc sessions. I believe it's about every month or so. Uh, no, you can correct me. There are regular ad hoc sessions held um, for the whole study group. And that's an opportunity for all of the members to submit contributions about how they would like to see the question text change or the mandate of study group 16 changed. So that's the opportunity for regular experts to, to make their inputs. Once the study group as a whole has agreed to those changes, um, that information will be submitted from the study group to uh, WTSA as a consolidated proposal. And in the vast majority of cases, question texts and study group uh, mandates don't change much at WTSA. There's not enough time. So typically they're agreed by the study group experts and, uh, and they're approved as submitted more or less uh, by WTSA. So my recommendation is if you think something is missing or needs to be adapted, this, um, um, the ad hoc sessions, study group 16 ad hoc sessions for WTSA would be the time to, to raise them. So, but as you mentioned that uh, this is only the 
uh, arrangement or coordination inside of the ITOT or the WTSA only focus on the different SC. I, I see, yeah. But, uh, how about the uh, like the standardization of the three different uh, international organizations, like the ISO and the, the ITOT, the boundary, and uh, you know that the ISO may be focused on the, some traditional uh, industrial, and also it converged to the ICT and the more intelligent, but we focus on the ICT technology, but we only, we also want the traditional industry to use this new uh, technologies. So what is the boundary and who will be the, uh, to do the coordinate? Yeah. Yeah. These are brilliant questions because they're very difficult questions. Um, so there is a, the world standards begins with C world standards coordination. There's an entity which is made up of, uh, ITU, ISO and IEC. So there is a body that meets regularly to do exactly this kind of coordination to work out um, where are the gaps, where are the overlaps. And the truth is there are, there are always going to be some overlaps, for example, with security. It's, it's impossible not to have some overlaps, but the idea is at least to manage and coordinate as much as possible. So I would say, again, as a technical expert, if you have concerns about a particular aspect being coordinated, that's one of the reasons the management team, which is you can go up through the management team and senior leadership can make a decision, can make a recommendation to the appropriate coordination body within ITU to make sure that those coordination aspects are reflected. So there's no one size fits all, but this idea of gaps and overlaps, it permeates every part of our work. So the important thing is the experts who know need to voice their concerns. And probably that would go up through the leadership team within uh, the study group and then across as appropriate to, to the, the coordination body. Thanks. Thanks very much. I fully agree. Yeah. Okay. If no uh, overlap, they will have no coordination. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, Olivier, you raised your hand. Uh, yes. Thank you, Rob. I just want to add on the coordination. Uh... Uh, issues that we have the uh, standards program coordination group SPCG between ISO, IEC and, and ITUT, uh, which I, I think I can say works quite well and probably goes down to a much detail level, a technical level compared to, to WSC, which by the way is, I think, cooperation, not coordination, the C. <laughs> uh, over to you. Excellent, thank you, Olivier. So that's the coordination group. And, and I think the point I, I made before still stands, which is you would go through the management team and they would coordinate with the uh, SPG, yes, ISPG. Yes, please. Uh, I have a quick question regarding the meeting procedure. Uh, is it allowed to reopen the discussion if the editor has identified some concerns despite uh, consensus being reached? These are brilliant questions today very difficult ones. Um, typically, when a decision is made, that closes the debate. And in fact, the, um, the, um, the chair of the meeting often says, I'm closing discussion now. And by using the, uh, the hammer or by, by saying the words, we're closing the discussion now, that should normally be um, genuine closure of the discussion for this, for this phase. There are several ways of getting around that. Um, it could be that if someone raises an issue uh, if it's a genuine, if, if it's a simple, genuine issue, it can, it is, is always possible to open discussion with the agreement of the, of the experts. It's often possible, the way I've seen this reconciled normally is if the discussion comes up after the issue is resolved at the question level, um, any questions that are, that are raised can be addressed at the working party level. So in fact, there is an opportunity to, to reopen discussion at the working party level instead. But typically, it shouldn't be going back over um, issues that have been discussed previously. Another way to do it would be to refer to the next meeting of the group. So um, um, if an issue is raised um, after the closure of discussion, uh, it could be possible to submit a contribution or a TD to the next meeting of the group and, uh, and address that issue at the appropriate time the next time the, the issue is raised. It depends a lot um, from one situation to another. But I think you've raised an important point that normally when we close discussion, that's it. The, the discussion is then closed. So it'd be very unusual to reopen discussion. Thank you. 
I see we've just gone past two o'clock, so I'm afraid, I'm sorry, Noah, that <laughs> there, there wasn't time to cover your material. Actually, uh, Rob, thank you very much, but no worry. I think we um, need to change the plan rather than I still continue to give a presentation. I probably will upload my presentation on TD so people can have just browse them. So I think it's a very strong and <laughs> interesting Rob's uh, slides. I think you can uh, have maybe a next uh, 15 minutes also. So inside, then I leave. Uh, the last uh, maybe a 10 to 15 minutes for people to have a very brief food. I think uh, the cafeteria stay open uh, yeah. to grab something like the brand. <laughs> so mm -hmm. because I don't think the hunger will be something they be pleasant with, given they are still have a uh, uh, maybe four or five hours walk ahead. So uh, we change the plan. So I will upload my slides. So you will uh, find it later on. That's. Uh, still focus on the question and a session with uh, Rob. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Noah. Um, so yes, the um, the cafeteria is open until four o'clock. So uh, I realize I'm currently standing between you and your lunch. I, I don't want to do that, but uh, I'm more than happy. I'm, I'm at your disposal. If you have any other uh, questions, I'm more than happy to take them now. Sorry, I can't hear. Oh, uh, where can we get this recording video? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'll um, I'll check with the um, e-meetings team after this session, and uh, I'll coordinate with Simao. So if you contact Simao or uh, Heba after the session, they can tell you where the recording can be found. I see Simao's uh, raised his hand. Please go ahead, Simao. Yeah, th thank you, Rob, for the presentation and uh, the time that you're spending with us today. Um, for the recording, I'll get the link to that, and then I will issue a revised OTD TD plan, adding the link to it. Thank you. Perfect. So um, after this session, if you look at uh, TD 115 of the plan, se uh, plan series, revision one, uh, you'll find Noah's slides and also um, the recording or a link to the recording of the session. Any other comments, any other questions before we close? I see no hands. So with that, uh, I'll say thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for these really excellent questions. I hope I was at least partially able to, to answer them. Uh, Noah, please. OK, uh, once again, uh, let's um, um, express our uh, thanks to Rob with um, um, applause. <laughs> Yeah, and I also uh, sincerely hope we can apply the message we learned from Rob today uh, in our day-to-day -day work. Uh, that's the real uh, intention and motivation uh, for having a continuous uh, training from one meeting to another. So every time when we have the stock system meeting, we always, even if we try to squeeze time, but we do manage to squeeze time for such a training. So we are proud prioritize the most important thing, give them enough time. Okay, thank you. The meeting finished. Okay, and then um, we can look forward to the very hard <laughs> workload in the afternoon. Okay, thank you for coming. <laughs>